in an age you have. Well, creativity is wonderful, but it's certainly not magical. And nor is it confined to a tiny romantic elite. It's an aspect of general human intelligence. We all have it, we're not all Mozart, but we all have creativity. Uh, and what I mean by creativity <coughs> is the ability to come up with ideas that are new, surprising, and valuable. And before I say anything else, I have to say something about new, what that means. New, in this context, means new to the person, or the computer system, new to the person who has come up with that idea. It doesn't matter <coughs> how many times that idea has been thought of before, as long as it's new in a relevant sense to the person concerned, and it's surprising and it's valuable, um, then I've counted as creative. Now, it may be that I mean, a subset of those ideas are going to be, so far as we know, new to the whole of human history. And those are the ones that tend to get into the history books. But, um, as I said, we are not all those up. Uh, actually, I do think probably all of us come up uh, a couple of times in our lives, maybe more, with historically new ideas, you know, a new pun, a new joke, um, which nobody has come up with before and perhaps never will again. Um, but uh, mostly we come up with stuff that's new to us, but not necessarily historically new. But that is the sort of creativity I'm talking about because it's a subset of that which is historically new creativity. And it follows from what I've said <coughs> that any artificial general intelligence would have to have creativity because it's an aspect of ordinary human intelligence. Okay? Um, so if you haven't got creativity, you most certainly have not got um, a general intelligence. Uh, so if you like, that's the justification. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a justification for having a talk on creativity in a conference like this. Um, so the question is how one go about it. Well, there are three different sorts of creativity, by which I mean uh, three different sorts of computational process, psychological process, which can lead to new ideas. Um, and actually, they each have their own sort of surprise. And I call them combinational, exploratory, and transformational. And combinational creativity is the one, <coughs> the only one actually, that you will normally hear people talk about. People who define creativity, and even people who spend their entire professional life studying creativity, uh, psychologists, professional psychologists, you know, who do experimental work on creativity and so forth, uh, they normally define it uh, in terms of coming up with unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. And of course, a huge uh, amount of creativity is just that. Uh, think of the wonderful imagery in poetry, for example. Think of analogy, whether in, in art or in science. Uh, think of collage. There are lots and lots of examples. Um, of combinational creativity, um, so it's certainly an important example. So that's one thing which you would have to be able to model if in an AGI. Uh, and the sort of surprise that you get there is what I would call a statistical surprise. Um, it's a surprise at something happening which is unusual, you didn't expect it, and which even once it's happened, you're sort of surprised that it happened. You're still surprised that it happened. And uh, I think an uh, analogy would be an outsider winning the derby. You don't expect it. It's surprising when it happens. Even after it's happened, there's a sense in which it's still surprising. Uh, but, you know, fair enough. Uh, not particularly earth-shaking sort of surprise. Nor, there is, nor is there an earth-shaking sort of surprise for exploratory creativity. And what I mean by exploratory creativity is coming up with a new idea. By the way, I'm using idea here in a catch-all sense. It may be an idea, uh, or it may be uh, a statue, or it may be an engineering design, 
Okay, so it may be an artifact, it may be a concept, I'm using it in a very general sense. It, it explores your creativity. The person comes up with a new idea, a new structure, uh, which fits into a previously accepted cultural style. Usually, uh, the culture that the style has come out of is the person's own culture, right? That's usual. Occasionally, um, all or part of it is borrowed from another culture. As Picasso, for example, when he uh, painted the Demoiselle d'Avignon, one of the things that was going on there was that he had been impressed by African masks. And if you think of the faces of the women in that picture, um, you can see the influence there, which is one of the reasons why it wasn't um, uh, uh, accepted at the time. And by the way, that was not exploratory creativity, it was transformation creativity. We'll come to that in a moment. The point is, in exploratory creativity, and also in transformation creativity, you start out with a previously accepted style of thinking. In painting, in chemistry, in mathematics, whatever it is, you do not originate that style. Okay, um, and you accept that style, and you you accept the rules, the constraints of that style, and you come up with a new structure, a novel structure, certainly novel to you, and in many cases novel to human history, um, which fit in. So, for example, um, if you analyse uh, a new chemical molecule. Um, in a family of molecules, which is already um, reasonably familiar, um, you're doing exploratory creativity. If you paint an impressionist picture, um, and you're not in the very, very early days, you're not one of the pioneers of impressionism, you're doing exploratory creativity. Um, and actually, even if you're Mozart, you're probably doing exploratory creativity. Um, because Mozart was not hugely adventurous in the sense of making radical musical transformations um, in musical style. He was amazingly successful uh, in exploring and exploiting the possibilities inherent in the style um, that he was working with at the time. Um, so the sort of surprise that attends exploratory creativity um, is the surprise of seeing something new, you've never seen it before, perhaps seeing something which is not just new, but actually when you first see it, you, you may think, oh, I wouldn't have thought that would have been possible. But when you look at it, when you think about it more, you realize that, yes, indeed, uh, it does fit, fit into the previous style, um, and indeed you can understand it in terms of the previous style. You can accept it in terms of the previous style. And I would say that, I don't know, at least 95, maybe 98, you know how you measure these things, percent of creativity, of professional scientists and professional artists, never mind you know, all of us every day having conversations in railway carriages, um, is exploratory creativity. It is not to be sneezed at. But there is a third sort of creativity which I call transformation of creativity. And that, if you like, rides piggyback on exploratory creativity. Because in transformation of creativity, what happens is that the previous accepted style, okay, in which the person con concerned will uh, <coughs> be working, um, as I said, that has a number of rules, a number of constraints, a number of conventions. One or more of those rules is changed in some way. It may be denied, deleted, it may be dropped. It may be um, negated, we should about the same thing. Um, it may be weakened, it may be strengthened, it may be modified in, in some other way. Um, just one very, very famous example, think of the very famous story about Kekulé and, um, you know, looking at the flames in the fire and seeing the flames um, doing sort of this and doing that. Um, he was reminded of um, a snake uh, biting its own tail 
And another way of saying that, and, and he said, oh, what was that? And then he had a hunch that this was perhaps relevant when he was puzzling about the structure of the benzene molecule and um, went off and did some chemical sums, which actually didn't quite come up right, but never mind that, I haven't got time to go into that. Went off and did some chemical sums and said, yes, that is what the benzene molecule is. In other words, it isn't an open string like all organic molecules have been thought about before. Actually, largely due to Kekele himself, he said a molecule is a, a long string of, of atoms mixed together. It's a closed string. In other words, it's a topological change from an open string to a closed string. And um, by definition, what a topological change does is it, cha it uh, it alters neighbour relations. And of course, Kekulé and every other competent chemist at the time, middle of the, in the uh, 19th century, knew that what's important to how a, a molecule behaves is not just what atoms are in it, but which atoms are next to which other, next door to which other atoms. Okay? So if you have a molecule like this, and you make it into a molecule like that, Neighbourhood relations have changed, and so you can expect that there may be a change in chemical behaviour, and indeed there was, and what there was uh, from that idea was a whole new branch of chemistry, aromatic chemistry, in which a whole host of questions arose, which just could not have been posed before. Um, and similarly, in, um, I mentioned Picasso and the Demoiselle and so forth, um, in the um, Cubist movement in art at the beginning of the last century, um, what happened was there was a transformation from art painters thinking we have got to be work working from a single viewpoint. And we all go around all there, unless we sort of cross our eyes, uh, we're all seeing things from a single viewpoint. And if I hold this up, you, can, you can't see the face if I hold it like that of this watch. If I hold it like that, you can. And um, that was just taken for granted. Well, one of the things the Cubists did was to say, don't let's take that for granted. Uh, we all know that if we walk around the thing, we will see other sides of it as a three-dimensional object. Let's put that into our paintings. And I suggest that was a fundamental transformation. Uh, it wasn't just tweaking the style the conceptual space, if you like, of, of painting, which had existed before. It was a fundamental transformation. So those are just two examples, and I'm sure you can all think of lots and lots of others. Um, and the sort of surprise which attends transformation of creativity is what I call an impossibilist surprise. In other words, when, you, when this new idea uh, arises, whether it's in your mind or somebody else's, um, your initial reaction is, but that's impossible. <coughs> and not just your initial reaction either. You, you look at it for one, that you may not be able to understand it. It seems, and it is indeed, I, I will kind of argue, something which could not have, origin, have arisen before that transformation in the style concerned, okay? Um, so it's not just like the outside winning the derby. It's surprising and remains surprising, but it's not impossible. And nobody ever thought it was impossible, just thought it was very, very, very unlikely. Um, transformation of creativity gives you things which, at least initially, and sometimes for many years, appear to be impossible. And that's why transformation of creativity typically has such a hard time being uh, accepted, certainly by the general public, uh, and in many cases by the person's, uh, you know, fellow artists or fellow scientists. Again, I'm sure you can all think of lots of historical examples. Some of them are very sad, actually. Um, so those are the three sorts of creativity. And if an age <coughs> of is ever going to exist, actually, I'm not as optimistic about it as uh, many people in this room, but anyway, I'll come to that. If an AGI is ever going to exist, it's certainly going to have to uh, feature all of those types of creativity. And if you look at modeling of creativity in AI, uh, you will find that um, each of them uh, has been modeled up to a point. Um, and you might think that uh, combinational creativity 
from the AI point of view, AI models point of view, must be a doddle. It must be, you know, much easier than the other two. I mean, after all, you know, what could be simpler than um, feeding a lot of uh, data or examples, whether it's graphic examples or whether it's mathematical examples or verbal concepts, whatever it is, feeding a lot of stuff into a computer and getting it to pick things out at random and put them together. So we're talking about unfamiliar, you'll get lots of unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. Well, yes, <laughs> true. But don't forget the third part of the definition, which was valuable. Now, I can't tell you what's, what meaning here valuable has, because it has an indefinitely large number of meanings. Even in science, it's very difficult to actually express just what uh, the value of new ideas, as opposed to um, the lack of value in certain other new ideas, comes down to, and you know, philosophers of science spend, spend much of their time trying to do that. Um, in the arts, it's even more difficult, of course, because you haven't got the, um, or in most sorts of art, you haven't got the discipline of trying to fit the world in any way. Um, and if you like, anything goes, but of course, not anything goes, even in the most radical types of art. There are conventions, there are rules, but those rules change. And not only do they change, and not only are they different in different cultures and at different times in one and the same culture, but they, uh, they can change overnight in, our, um, in today's world. They can literally change overnight. If some enormously famous celebrity um, wears a, a new sort of uh, jewelry or clothing at a party and the paparazzi are there, and this picture is splashed all over the front pages next day, it may very well, uh, you know, be in your local um, next, uh, the following week. So, valuable is hugely important. And the problem with combinational creativity from the AGI point of view is, um, you want to have uh, valuable unfamiliar combinations. And this means, I mean, you could spend days talking about what this means, but in a very tiny nutshell, what this means is um, combinations that are somehow relevant, that we regard as relevant. Um, not just new and exciting, that's already assumed, but relevant. For example, um, when Shakespeare, think of Macbeth, and uh, Shakespeare's uh, imagining um, Macbeth, after he's murdered Banquo, and he can't sleep, he's so guilty, he just cannot sleep. And there's a wonderful um, speech, I just mentioned the first line, a wonderful philosophy from Macbeth, where he says, um, he's just desperate for sleep, he says, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. And I mean, basically what he's saying is, you know, sleep makes you feel better, sleep cures you of your worries, and I wish I could get some. But who but Shakespeare would have thought of describing sleep as a knitter? Probably, you know, an old lady sitting in a fireplace. And not just a knitter who is knitting something new, like a new scarf, you know, for a grandson. She is knitting up the raveled sleeve of care. In other words, something has been damaged. In this case, um, Macbeth's uh, peace of mind. It's been damaged, it's now being repaired, right, by the litter in the uh, image, by sleep in the actual reality, what he's, what he's talking about. So we see the relevance of this. <coughs> we understand that it's a very imaginative and unusual way of thinking about sleep. And it's absolutely spot on in terms of relevance. And if you actually look at the next few lines, you'll get the same sort of thing in each line. It's absolutely extraordinary. Now, that sort of relevance is, is what you want. It doesn't have to be, you know, as, as marvelous as it, an image as, as that. But it has to be, it has to make sense, and it has to be non-obvious and um, hopefully witty and or insightful, as this one is. And uh, getting a computer to do that 
is a very different matter from just getting a computer to shuffle ideas and put them together in new, well, in new ways, which is very, very simple. And one of the problems here, what well, the main problem here is, to get a sense of the human notion of relevance, um, which is a very deep and very difficult notion. I don't know if any, well, I'm sure some of you know a very interesting book by um, Dan Sperber and um, Deirdre Gen no, not Deirdre Gen Wilson, um, called Relevance, where they are trying to define relevance in computation, information processing terms. And uh, they say some very interesting things, but um, they don't say anything sort of very specific that you could take away and use to go and write a model of combination of creativity, uh, because even they um, can't, they can't specify relevance um, sufficiently clearly to get that done, although they give some interesting pointers. Now what I'm saying here is that in order to get combination of creativity of any interesting type, in there, you need to be able to do that. Do not hold your breath. I'm not saying it's impossible, because we don't do it by magic. I'm not saying it's impossible, in principle. I'm not even saying that it's impossible in practice. But if you want my bet, uh, do not hold your breath. It certainly, as I say, is not going to be within uh, the foreseeable future. It's a big, it's a big one. Okay, so that's combination of creativity. Exploratory creativity is much less difficult, although not easy, but much less difficult, because what exploratory creativity requires is A, a definition of the style of thinking concerned, whether it's impressionist painting or whether it's a um, certain branch of mathematics, which of course is clear enough to be able to put into the computer and so forth. So you need a definition of the style, <coughs> and you need a definition of um, ways of exploring the style and way the generative system, if you like. I think of the style as a generative system. So you need um, the rules of the generative system. You need uh, ways of um, cranking them so that you get to new structures uh, over there as well as over there. You also need a sense well, at least you don't need it for exploratory creativity, but for an AGI, you would need this. You would need um, a sense of what the limitations of that style are, what, it, what sort of structures it couldn't uh, produce, which you might like to have produced, but, you know, it won't do it. And it would be lovely if you also had um, an idea of what sorts of tweaking or, indeed, transformation you could do to enable it to come up with those structures that at the moment it cannot come up with. Okay. Uh, now, as I said, that's not easy. Um, again, if you, I mean, for instance, take musicologists or historians of art, I mean, there are people around us who spend their whole, entire professional lives trying to define uh, what the, ex explicitly, and not of course as as explicitly as you need for a computer system, try to say explicitly what a certain style of painting, for instance, is. What a certain style in music is. People spend their whole lives trying to do this. Um, so it's not easy, but uh, it can be done, and there are uh, quite a number already of um, computer programs which can do exploratory creativity and which can come up with stuff which is not only historically new uh, but also to many people um, seems to be very valuable okay um, so that I would say is the least difficult of the three sorts of creativity for an AGI transformation of creativity is more difficult to gain. Um, and somebody might say, well, people very often do say, you couldn't possibly have transformational creativity um, in a computer system. You couldn't possibly have a computer system that comes up with something radically new. Um, I mean, by definition, a computer system does what its program tells it to do, and that's that. It may do some very amazing things. It may do some things which you, had, you the programmer, 
had never imagined, had never thought of, and you, the programmer, can be very surprised, and not just by the bugs either. You can be very surprised by what the program comes up with, um, but it's never going to come up with something which immediately after you've seen this new thing and had a moment of surprise there, you remain surprised because you think it couldn't possibly have happened. Okay. Um, so people have that belief. Well, of course, it isn't actually true. I mean, for example, evolutionary programming, using genetic algorithms, gives you a way, um, provided you choose the types of mutations you're going to allow um, appropriately, uh, gives you a way of coming up with um, radical transformations. Um, you may not choose to do that, but that's another issue. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the um, images that Carl Sims produced by Evolution many, many years ago now, and they've been shown in art galleries as well as um, talked about in the AI press, where he allowed very radical mutations. For example, he allowed, um, we're talking about um, programs for producing visual images, colored images. And for instance, he allowed the thing uh, at random uh, to pick up a line of, uh, um, sorry, to pick out a little mini program which it had already uh, possessed, either because it was in there in the beginning or because it had already evolved it, and pick it up and put it into the middle of another one, right? For example, or to concatenate two of these things. And to cut a very, very long story short, the point about this is, if you allow that sort of mutation, you can get, and in Carl Sims's work you often do get, a situation in which even the, uh, some of the images in the next generation don't show any family resemblance with the previous images. And for sure, if you go down quite a number of um, generations, in some cases, there will be no family resemblance whatsoever. And if that isn't a, a, a radical transformation in the visual structure, I don't know what is. So that is certainly possible. And in fact, it's already happened. A and of course, um, people working in evolutionary art um, often, but not always, try to do this sort of thing. Why do they not always try to do it? Why did I say people may not choose to use that sort of mutation? Well, the reason is that if this sort of transformation has happened on the previous mutation, because the mutations are random, sure as hell, somewhere down here, there's going to be another one. So let's suppose, for it, let's just be very simple and true. Let's, for instance, we're talking about colours, right? And you you want to, to get this thing to come up with um, I don't know, blue and purple images, not uh, brown and orange images. And boy, a mutation happens, you know, and here you've got blue and purple. Lovely. <coughs> well, you're going to stop smiling soon, because very shortly you'll go back to the other one again, or to a different one, which you don't like either. In other words, you've got transformation of structure. Do not have transformation of style. A style of thinking, again, whether in art or in science, is a sustained way <coughs> um, of thinking. Um, and not just sustained for its own sake because you like it and you don't want it to go away, but sustained because you want to explore it further. You want to see what its potential is. You want to see uh, what's included in this style of thinking. What sort of things are aromatic molecules, right? Starting with benzene, yes, but lots and lots of others you can get out of benzene. You know, what about all that? If you just forget benzene and go back to what you were, you know, the all straight in the line, um, organic molecules that people were thinking about before, um, well, you never get to ask those questions. So even transformational creativity is a big problem for AGI. The problem is not in coming up with transformations, although, uh, of course, it's possible to come up with transformations which we don't find valuable. That's another issue. Um, but the problem is not in coming up with transformations. The problem is coming up with transformations which can be seen to be valuable and can be sustained while further exploration takes place, okay? And that
that, of course, implies that the system, uh, if it really is a standalone AGR, not an interactive system, uh, that implies that the system is capable of making these valuations. So it's another example of relevance. Okay? Um, and it's a big ask. Uh, so the common objection that you couldn't possibly have transformation of creativity in a computer system because it's all run by programs is, as I say, absolutely without question false. Because you can get transformations, we've already had transformations, and indeed we've had some valuable transformations. But in all the um, examples, uh, at least in, in art um, that I know of here, um, you've needed at each generation, or every five hundred work, at each generation, you've needed either a human being to pick the parents for the next generation, or a fitness function chosen by a human being and may be adjusted from time to time by the human being to do this. Now, admittedly, um, in some sort of scientific and mathematical problems, designing um, aeroplane engines, for example, you can give a, a, a problem to the thing, and the, to the evolutionary program, and it will work <coughs> out for itself. You can go down to the pub and let it get on with its thing, because you have been able to give it a fitness function which, uh, pre which defines exactly what, the re what is relevant and what is not for this particular task. Okay. So if it's the sort of problem where you can do that, then fine, uh, the computer can do it by itself. But if it's the sort of, pro uh, sort of problem where you can't do that, um, then uh, it cannot be put into a standalone, non-interactive AGI. And if you want an AGI which is absolutely isolated, standalone, not interactive, you're going to be able to um, cope with that problem. And that's why I said uh, right at the start of my talk that I'm not as optimistic about AGI as many people in this room are, because I think these issues are very deep, very, very difficult. I think they're even more difficult if, excuse me, if one's dealing with um, literature, verbal texts, um, than if one's dealing with, with graphics. Um, less difficult in the case of science and mathematics. Still difficult, but less, less difficult in those cases. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't bet um, a great deal of money, uh, or even <laughs> a fairly small amount of money, actually, uh, on this being done in our lifetimes. But it's certainly possible in principle. We've certainly started along the road. As I said, all three types of creativity have already been modeled to some extent. The problem is, it's a very small extent so far. So the challenge <coughs> for AGI, or part of the challenge for AGI, is to solve these problems. And of course, that will mean, uh, among other things, uh, that will mean making advances in other sorts of AI too. Knowledge representation, natural language processing, uh, computer graphics, a huge number of very deep, uh, an analogical thinking, a huge number of very deep problems uh, which you might initially think of as not having a great deal to do with creativity, but all of those problems are going to uh, crop up in coming up with uh, these three sorts of creativity um, in all domains of, of human thought. Uh, so it's a very, very big challenge, but I think it's an exciting one, because even if we never get uh, to an AGI, we'll certainly get further than we've got already, and even that is interesting enough, I think, when we look at what creativity is and how it works. We have a few minutes, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, Anders. 
Let's wait until uh, the mic. Thank you for an excellent lecture. Uh, so I was thinking about the problem that typically we pose problems to our machines or creative thinkers. We want them to solve something in a creative way. But this is that problems itself is a kind of style. So, you know, for example, when you have a multiple uh, uses task, you do, how many ways can you use a brick? Uh, you're supposed to list uses of a brick, not say, this is a stupid problem, I'm going to list uses of a box or do something else. Truly creative people, of course, in the new problems, uh, would you say this is a case of transformation or creativity applied to the problem itself? It's a, the problem space itself. Um. I think in the, this is an example of combination of creativity, not just in the sense that you may expect to get an answer, uh, which is combination of creativity, but the initial question itself, I would say was an example of combination of creativity in the sense that it's looking at a particular concept, this case brick, and, um, and asking, well, you know, what are the, what sorts of intelligent, intelligible associations can you make with a brick? Okay, one association is putting it in a wall, a house that you're building. But you know, there are other ones. So I would say that that is an example of, um, of, of a combination of creativity. Uh, but you're right, I mean, very often, uh, a large part of the creativity is thinking of the question. But that's partly why I said that in exploratory creativity, um, if you're really, uh, a master of the space concerned. And if you have got any reasonable chance of with a um, valuable transformation of it, uh, you've got to have a good sense, A, of what the limits are of the space, and B, um, of the ways in which you might be able to tweak or modify certain aspects of it, certain defining dimensions of it, in order to come up with structures which previously were just impossible. And of course, not everybody has that. And if you ask me, well, you know, what's the computational process, the psychological mechanisms that underlie that sort of insight, um, I don't know. But that is one of the questions that needs to be asked by people working in the computer modeling of creativity. Or in this case, of exploratory creativity. You know in order to get to the transformational examples. Thanks, Betty. Uh, there's something you didn't mention that I thought would come up. Um, I won't spend a lot, a lot of time on it, as you may or may not recall eventually. It's uh, ontological creativity, where a new concept is produced which is not definable in terms of anything any combination of previous concepts. This has happened over and over again in the history of science. It enables new questions to be asked. For instance, concept of gene cannot be defined, I think, in terms of things that were there before. Uh, Newton's concept of mass was not uh, definable in terms of previous <coughs> concepts. It sort of, uh, well, it uh, came as part of a theory. And this is generally what happens when there are major advances in science, is a theory which includes new concepts that are not were not previously definable, but are partly defined by their role in the theory. And as the theory changes, the meaning changes too. And that seems to be an important aspect of human creativity. I guess kids are doing it far, in far more ways than anybody's noticed. Yes, well I think that's uh, true, but it's not, I wasn't arguing that they would have to be defined in terms of previous ideas. No, I'm saying but you didn't mention this at all, this uh, notion of ontological creativity. No, because I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that it's, that it's a separate example. I mean, for example, would you say that Kekulé was doing ontological creativity? I would have uh, thought he was, the way you just described it. He didn't use a concept that was not previously in the language. Well... As far as I know. <sighs> the two well, parts draw that. Yes. Uh, hmm. There won't be an argument about mass, I can't, I can't talk about mass, I don't know, I'm not a physicist at all. Give me another example. Well, I think what Einstein did No, 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 give me another, I don't want an example from physics. No, I don't want an example from 
that is typically the case. And I think that the examples that um, Aaron is asking us to think about and I, uh, are, are like that. They are so different from what was previously there. They're not totally new. They don't come out of nowhere. But they're, they're so different um, that their value, their import, at first can't be understood <coughs> even by the person, very often, you know, by the person's peers. Never mind by, you know, the man on the Captain Omnibus. It may take many years for them to be able to, to explain. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was lovely, Margaret. I, I'm very interested in the role of empathy and creativity. And I wonder if you've got anything to say about the relationship of empathy to the three different types of creativity. Well, um, I haven't said anything about motivation and emotion at all in my talk. I was just talking about how, uh, the cognitive issues, you know, how a new idea can arise. Now, it is actually, of course, the fact that motivation and emotion um, are hugely important, more important in certain cases than others, but they're always important, not least for transformation of creativity. Because by definition, transformation of creativity comes up with something which people previously thought was impossible, and once you've done it, they probably aren't going to be able to understand it anyway. Um, so you have got to be a very strong character. You've got to be not only you know, committed to your work, as many of us are, many people in this room actually, committed to their work, whatever it is. You've also got to be, very often, extremely selfish. Right? Very little empathy for other people, especially the people you're living with. Because you are so committed to what you're doing, you know that nobody else understands it, you know that nobody else is going to value it, at least at first. So you've got to have the self-confidence, the arrogance, if you like. You've got to have the self-confidence, the motivation uh, to do it and to get on with it. Um, and there's a fascinating book by Howard Gardner called um, Something Like Seven Creators of the 20th Century, where he looks at uh, seven people in very, very different forms of creativity areas, I mean, choreography and politics and poetry and so forth, music. Uh, and he, he isn't asking my question, which is, you know, how do these ideas arise? Mm -hmm. He's asking what sorts of personality structure do these people have, and to put, uh, put it in a, uh, very crudely, they were all swine, dreadful people to live with, <laughs> utterly <laughs> selfish and committed. Now, for exploratory creativity and combination of creativity, of course, that doesn't apply. So I'm just talking about transformation of creativity there. Mm -hmm. And empathy, um, I would say that if exploratory creativity you're concerned with is um, exploring the human psyche, which of course is what novelists, many poets, <coughs> poetists do, um, then yes, you are going to need uh, empathy to do it well. And, um, and I think there's some very, very interesting 
issues there which we can't say very much about with any clarity because um, we only have a very sort of vague, intuitive sense of what, A, what, even what we mean by empathy, and certainly B, how empathy works, you know, what the computational mechanisms are. But, I mean, if you're implying there's an AGI that was going to, you know, would need empathy, you're absolutely right, because without empathy, there are all sorts of relationships, both in real life and in sort of creative fiction, you know, with other human beings that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't have. So it's an important question, but I don't have, beyond that, I don't have anything constructive to say about it. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, you said that creativity was some, the construction of something that was new. Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. Um, is this better? Yeah. You said that creativity was the construction of something that was new, surprising, and valuable. Um, and you also said that creativity was um, a subset of general intelligence. So I was wondering, um, new and surprising, they don't really seem to have any ties with, intel with human intelligence. But you define value in terms of, human in ter of, in terms of humans. I was wondering if it was possible to untackle that, if you could have a notion of the processes behind creativity um, in such a way that they could need some other value measure. Sorry, I don't understand your question, can you? Um, well, it's striking that like solving the human question of value, like what is valuable to a human, might be a different question than trying to solve the notion of uh, the problem of creativity. Okay, I think you're raising the Bauerberg problem, <laughs> what I call the Bauerberg problem. Um, I have been talking just about human creativity, creativity in human beings. I haven't been talking about uh, creativity in non-human animals. Is there any creativity in non-human animals? Well, of course, there's novel certain animals. You know, come up with um, new things, surprising things that are surprising certainly to us, and in some cases, like the power bird, you know, things that are even valued by us. But um, I wouldn't want to say, and I'm not sure about some of the non-human primates. That's another issue. Uh, certainly below the primate. I don't know that I'd want to say um, that there was anything one would want to call creative in any sort of strong sense over and above adaptive and intelligent and, and so on because uh, I don't think you can um, usefully make these distinctions between the three sorts of creative, creativity that I've been talking about um, in, with the animals because I don't think you've got the same um, sort of background, if you like, of, on the one hand, a rich store of different concepts or um, cultural styles. Now, of course, tool making in certain species, you know, um, the, t the tools that um, a chimpanzee makes if it lives in this part of Africa will be different from the ones that they're using in this part. So, but they're not, so I would say they're habits, which are, um, originated in some cases and then learned you know, by Africans in different places. So if you want to call them cultural, fine. But um, they're not explored. They're not self-consciously thought about. They're very, very different thing. Personally, I wouldn't want to call it creativity. If you want to call it creativity, well, fine, call it creativity. But notice the huge differences, largely due to language, of course the huge differences between surprising novelties in non-human animals and the sorts of surprising novelties which you get in human animals. And as I say, the root, I think, of that ultimately is language. So I had a question for you myself, which was of, of, of a different sort. We've had a bunch of deep, interesting, uh, deep questions about creativity and so forth. So, Actually, I wanted to ask a little more about your views on the difficulty of AGI and the timing of achieving AGI. I think your perspective is interesting. If you look at, say, Ray Kurzweil, for example, he looks at the exponential rate of growth of various kinds of technology of you know, brain scanning, computer hardware, computer software, and so forth. And he says, due to these exponential growth curves, the achieving of human-level AGI is 
almost sure to occur in the middle of the century, which I tend to agree with his view, although not perhaps with the same narrow confidence bars that he puts around his, his, his time estimate. Now, your view, as I roughly understand it, seems to be that achieving human-level AGI requires the solution of a bunch of difficult conceptual problems, and you may think that the rate of solution of these difficult conceptual problems is not going to increase exponentially. But that's, that's sort of my paraphrasing of your view. I'm, I'm, I'm curious for your, your actual response on this. Well, you paraphrased exactly right. And I think that uh, Kurzweil's, certainly his time estimates seem to me to be absolutely absurd. Absolutely <laughs> for the birds. And it's interesting that you mentioned brain scanning. Most brain scanning I mean, there are a few exceptions, and the biggest exception to this and this wonderful work of Chris Frith. But, and I, by the way, I put my skeptical view, which I'm about to express, I put this view to him once, and I sort of said, basically, I said 95% of uh, 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 a brain scanning is um, unscientific. Um, natural history at the moment sort of pretty useless and unmotivated and he said no 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 you're wrong 98 percent right <laughs> so yeah, that's true and most brain scanning today is people just fishing for correlations okay they're not guided by any uh decent psychological theory what i mean by decent psychological theory is something which is well, I mean, uh, um, ideally, it can be expressed in computational terms, but even if it can't be expressed in computational terms in the sense of writing a computer model of it, right, that it, it is expressed in terms of the sorts, broad, of broad types of computation that are going on. So, for example, if you've got um, uh, a psychological theory of autism, which involves reference to the theory of mind of certain sorts of... Um, uh, deficiencies in theory of mind, then you can start asking interesting questions of the brain scanners to look for certain things and not others, and if you find them, that is theoretically interesting. That is just one example of the work that Chris Frith has done. But most brain scanning is not like that. Yeah. Uh, and at best it's natural history. Now I'm not saying natural history is a waste of time. If Darwin hadn't done lots of natural history for the previous years of his life, if he hadn't had correspondence with pigeon fanciers and, and you know all sorts of people all over the world, if he hadn't had a hugely rich thought of natural history, he could not have come up with the theory of evolution. But he couldn't come up with the concept, of course, people already had. He couldn't have come up with the mechanism of the evolution and the, the evidence that he gave for, for, for that mechanism. So natural history is crucial, but the point is that natural history much of it has been around for decades, and some of it for more, you know, many, many, many decades. So I have one brief, uh, brief follow so, so, so when we get a neuroscientific understanding, if and when, if and when, we get a neuroscientific understanding of creativity, um, or anything else interesting, uh, it will require, it will have to sit on the base of a huge amount of, of, of natural history. And so the sort of brain scanning stuff that's being done now will be of use then, but at the moment it isn't. It's, you know, any theoretical fishing expeditions which just don't help. And, um, and in order to get um, a neuroscience of creativity, you need, never mind, AGI, a neuroscience of creativity, you need to be able to answer all those questions I've been talking about. And the only ones that they can get in even the beginnings of a handle on at the moment is combination of creativity. And they can't get a handle on relevance there, but at least they can get an, well, a you know, good handle on how, in general terms, it's possible for combinations to happen in the brain. But the exploratory creativity, transformation of creativity, the neuroscientists don't have the beginnings of the way of understanding so you, you, You've almost answered my follow-up question, which was, to elicit a little creativity from you on the following topic. Now, suppose it turns out that Kurzweil was right and we get human level of AGI by 2030 or 2040. If that were going to happen, how do you think it would happen? What would be the, least, the most likely path for that outcome to come about? I think it's inconceivable. I, I think it's inconceivable. <laughs> I think it's inconceivable. 
<laughs> I mean, and all I can say is we would have to have answered all of those questions and more that I raised this morning, and uh, for the third time, I think I'll say it, do not hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's go to one more question. Inside out phrenology. <laughs> Inside out Brain, uh, brain I'm going to oh, thank you very much indeed. I'm I, I, I wondered about the cultural aspects of this, because in a sense, you, you're talking about value or relevance, and you need to value or relevance to something. And the examples that you gave of human creativity were very much based in human culture. We do need to have a culture of ATIs, of artificial intelligent machines themselves, in order to be able to assess the creativity of these kinds of machines? Um, well, they would need to be able to, um, to assess it in order to come up with things which we value. That's why I made the point about the fitness function and the interactivity or non-interactivity in the case of evolutionary programming. Um, so, so, yes, if you're asked... So that is my answer to the, if you like, the question of practice here, the practical question whether or not you could get a system which looked as though it had AGI. If you're asking the deeper philosophical question of supposing you had a system that looked as though it had AGI, would it actually be an AGI? Would it be genuinely intelligent, genuinely creative? I can't give you a quick answer to that because to answer that question <coughs> would require um, a, full a very, very good understanding of a number of issues which are hugely um, controversial in philosophy. For example, the nature of consciousness, as much about the self criticism that's in uh, and value, the nature of intentionality. Uh, and the uh, nature of membership of a moral community. Because unless we were prepared to accept uh, these systems as members of our own moral community, um, we wouldn't, I think, be... Well, put it the other way around. If we were to accept these systems as being genuinely intelligent, genuinely creative, at a sort of human level, which is, you know, what the hypothesis is, then I think we would have to, uh, we would be committed then to accepting them into our moral community, which would mean, among other things, A, that they had responsibilities, uh, and right, uh, and B, that we would be, uh, we would be bound in certain situations to put their interests above our own. Now, if I make a, a if I make a date with somebody and um, or when I was 18 years old and made a date with somebody and I'm going to turn up at six o'clock and, uh, and and he's not there, right? He doesn't turn up till half past six. Right? I'm absolutely you know furious. I'm just about to leave actually. And he says to me, terribly sorry, terribly sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, my dog. I got home from work and you know to feed my dog and I found there was no dog food in the house. So I had to go around to the corner shop and buy dog food, and that's why I'm late. Well, I would forgive him. Of course I'd forgive him. Suppose he said to me, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I'm terribly sorry. I got home from work, and my computer, which was doing the Times crossword, um, um, uh, said, asked me to go and look in a reference book, with, which I had in the shelf, but it wasn't actually on Google. Uh, and it took me half an hour, I'm terribly sorry. Would I forgive him? No, I jolly well wouldn't. <laughs> but if it was a member of our moral community, I would have to accept that in some cases, you know, its interests should always be respected, uh, and in some cases should even be put above our own, as we put animals' interests above our own sometimes. And I don't see that happening. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have no more time for questions to keep on schedule. I just want to add that all these talks we're planning to put online, so if anyone who speaks from the audience has uh, any issues with that, please find us afterwards and we're happy to cut out that section of video. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Cash, you're, uh, my rude love, but, uh... <laughs>